Um, yep. I do want to go ahead and move to, you know, sort of the, the, the nostalgia part of this, which is, you know, I, when I think about these games, because a lot of people that have, you know, met me and who know that I've done this, they, you know, they, they, they kind of don't understand, but a lot of these people are people who never played these games uh, True. back when they came out. Of course, uh, I was a little bit younger, but I was still playing them. I saw my brother play them, and then I started playing them. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so there's always, there was always a sense of magic for me in these games, um, and, and, and I still feel it even playing them, you know, 20 years after their glory days. Um, why do you think it's still important? for us to keep these games alive well you know there definitely you know is the sense of nostalgia there you know but a good product a good game it is a good game i mean that's why i still play pac-man today 30 years later you know like why because it's entertaining and it's fun and it's enjoyable in these games there was that magic in them there was the the magic and the story, you know, the way that it unfolded and how you got to interact with the universe, you know? And sometimes, you know, like, you know, there's always going to be people that are pushing and innovating, you know, as they call it, and they push boundaries. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, you know? But, uh, I mean, it's the same It's the same thing in, in, in any kind of artistic genre. Why do you think that people still listen to you know, the music of the 60s and 70s like crazy. Why does Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, which is a 40-year-old album this year, still sell millions of copies a year? Because it's good music, because it's enjoyable, and because even new generations can find it, you know, uh, amazing. You know, I've got, uh, you know, a 13-year-old nephew who just – you know, is discovering like this music of the sixties and seventies and like Pink Floyd and he's starting to learn guitar and he's playing it and he loves it. You know, it's cause it's good. It's the same thing with these games, you know, it's because they're good. The formula worked, you know, there was like a magic stride that was just hit. And I think that can resonate with anybody who's out there looking for an enjoyable you know, gaming experience. And these games are a mixture of, you know, playing a game, but also, you know, um, having a story unfold and, you know, be told. And, you know, there's a certain charm in that and there's a certain, you know, uh, nostalgia in that. But I think that it can not only affect people who are in my age, you know, in their mid thirties, you know, as well as people that are younger than that. So that's why, you know, I'm into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's, there's a question out there and a lot of people have posed this, but I, I know that you've pretty much answered that question, which is, is it still possible to produce these adventure games uh, after they have fallen out of, you know, the mainstream for so many years? But instead of asking that question, because I do know that you believe that that is possible, um, I'm going to ask you, out of the companies out there right now, the established uh, or slash commercial and the independent, who do you think right now is doing very interesting things with the genre? Oh, you know, um, uh, you've got... uh... Uh, Senscape, you know, uh, led by uh, Augustine Cordes, who just uh, got Asylum funded. He did this great game, Scratches, a few years ago. You know, I think he's doing, uh, I think he's doing some great things in kind of the horror mystery, you know, genre. Uh, Phoenix Online, with their series Cognition now, uh, you know, is doing some really great stuff with crime thrillers, and they're working with Jane Jensen on her next game, Mobius. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know those guys and I talk to them and, and they're doing amazing things. And, of course, you have Himalaya Studios, which is, you know, a, a commercial branch, you know, the offshoot of uh, AGDI, you know, which, you know, is the group that originally inspired us, you know, despite, you know, like our little, you know, pretend tiffs and rows back in the day. You know, back when we were all doing this for fun and for free, you know, there was a a healthy amount of competition and joking around, but we've all been at this for over a decade now. And, you know, we all have so much respect for each other. You know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, I, those guys are, are doing some amazing things. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to their games. Uh, there's, uh, 
on this game coming out, uh, Reincarnation, that uh, was kickstarted around the same time as ours. I mean, there's so many out there. I've got a list, you know, written down of all these games that I'm looking forward to that I've backed on Kickstarter personally. And uh, there's there's so much going in this community. And uh, we're all becoming tighter in supporting each other. And I'm learning about more new adventure games every day. And, like, the cool thing is they're from developers all around the world, you know, and I really like that we're all forming these relationships, you know, where we're trying to help and support each other. Now, I'm going to put you in, in a hot spot right now, or the hot seat, and uh, I know that you mentioned before that there's a lot of people out there, and, and, and you were saying how it's painful that some of the people who helped out on, on these projects suddenly disappeared, uh, you know, um, very understandably sometimes because, you know, Life happens. Mm -hmm. um, but do you want to give a shout out to those people who you haven't uh, talked to and that you really appreciated, you know, the work that they did in the past? Oh, yeah. You know, um, I don't want to, you know, embarrass, you know, too many people or anything like that. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I have to say that Space Quest 2 would not have been possible without all the sprite work that Rich Eater did. Like, really, like he came in there for a couple of years and just, you know, killed it, you know, murdered, you know, doing all the sprites. And he did he did them so well, and he loved Space Quest so much. And he did it, and, uh, you know, and then he, he just kind of dropped out of uh, out of sight. You know, I think, uh, I think his own life caught up with him, and he had other things going on. But seriously, you know, um, you know, at least like 80% of the animations in the game are his, yeah, you know. Lucky. And um, we, got, we got lucky, you know, when uh, Jeremy Kitchen – uh, came aboard because you know he not only could do backgrounds and everything but he does tremendous animations too and he helped you know pick up that slack and do it too you know so and and it's i i think it's it's great that you uh, bring up uh, rich because when i was working on on sprite animations and um you know rich came on yep. um uh he was he was so so great and uh he pushed me so hard to you know catch up that you know i caught up with him and yeah. when when jeremy came in he was he he uh he was he started working on backgrounds and then he moved on to sprites because he thought it was really great and yeah. what's funny is that he learned uh to do some of these more complex animations i remember by looking at some of the templates that rich had left behind yeah so rich, rich did a lot of stuff to help help us and help everyone else you know so, that's... so his legacy sort of lived on and uh helped a lot of people in the team so that's uh he was really a great guy uh, yeah seriously like yeah i can't i can't think of that game without thinking about him and he was super funny and super nice too you know like we all got along real well yeah exactly now, uh, Steve, are there any? Because I know you've you've successfully managed to uh, you know establish your company. You're working on this uh, new project that we will uh, talk about in our second interview. But um, are there any words of you know advice that you want to give to budding new film? Uh, sorry, not film. That's me. Uh, game <laughs> makers uh, striving to make it out there right now. Let me tell you something, it, you know, if you want to do it, you're just going to have to go out and do it. I mean, that's what we did. There was no guide for how to do anything. We learned as we went on the fly and we just busted our buns to do it. Like Sean and I, I mean, you know, in the beginning when we started stuff, you know, we had very limited graphical experience and we were relying mostly on my horrible drawings and collages to put things together but we were we worked hard enough to be able to you know uh express our vision and express how we wanted to do things and that's how we got lucky enough to attract the kind of talent that we have now that likes to work with us and uh but you know you just have to go out there and do it i see all these people like oh i don't want to do it. you know what go out there make a crappy first game learn how to program an ags because pretty much anyone can do it and, you know, learn how to make a few bad graphics in MS Paint and do it and make something good. You know, tell your story. Make sure that you tell it, you know, tell it right. Tell it well. But just persevere. You know, that's the only thing you can do. I mean, this didn't happen, you know, for us or to us overnight. You know, this, you know, we've been together doing this 
for 10 years as of this year. So, I mean, it's all about perseverance. All right. Uh, thank you, Steve. And uh, please, everybody, stay tuned. We will have a second interview with uh, Stephen Alexander where we will talk about specifically about uh, QFI, Quest, Quest for Infamy. So uh, stay, stay tuned for that. That's not happening. <laughs> All right. I love you. I love you too, Steve. Oh, God. Today... I'd like to talk to you about a serious problem that we're having in this world. That there is a definite lack of crabs going on now due to people shaving their pubic regions. What? Steve, now that we're off the air, really. Yes. Let's talk, yeah, oh, God. Let, let's, let, let's talk about Broomy. He's such a dickhead. Such. Such a little penis. A little British penis. Americans are weird, right? Yeah, yeah. Weird, weird, weird two prawn dicks. Um, I'm actually uh, pretty surprised that you didn't uh, talk about your favorite um, French. I know that this is your your personal favorite French author, uh, uh, Balzac. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because you're a fan, you're a fan of Balzac. So, oh yes, <laughs> it's become a problem. Crabs used to be the common STD. You would just get the shampoo. And you would go about your business, and you would have the pride in knowing that you, yes, you, had contracted a sexually transmitted disease that you could boast to about your friends. If you know how you really get rid of crabs, right? I, you, you know. Shave, I, you shave one ball, and so yes. all the crabs move to the other ball. Ah, well, well, you, then, that's crab division. You can't do that. That's racist. Right, but well, definitely <laughs> the balls act. You, <laughs> No, but you know, then you light the other ball on fire, and then you, when they run to the other ball, you take an ice pick and you just go at it like. Let's get to it. Good um, stuff. Penis. If he were a flavor of tea, he would be penis tea. I mean, he does. He does love his tea bags. So I'm. It's a tea bag boomy. That's what we call him. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Balzac. Rabbley, the, the, the Marquis de Sade. Yeah, it's definitely all in there. <laughs> it right there. Wait, you're going to stop it now? I thought we were off the air. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs>